All right. Thank you so much for, for having me and for organizing this conference. Um, I think what I'm going to talk about is going to complement a lot of other things very well, um, and especially Serafina's talk, so that's good. Uh, and just, I want to start off with a, a quick anecdote on this, because the last question we had was on the subject of the government being associated with justice or not. And there's a wonderful anecdote in a Roman novel by Apuleius called Metamorphoses. Usually it's called the golden ass in English translation because he gets transformed into a donkey. But when he's still human, um, he goes to the market and a friend of his has become a market official. And the friend is bragging about being a market official. And the, the main character has bought some fish. And the friend takes the fish and he's like, oh, you know, let me show you my authority. It's so terrible that these are, the quality of these fish is awful, even though there's nothing wrong with the fish. And he dumps them out and tramples all over them. And so the narrator is like, so then I was left with no fish and no money. <laughs> and that was the, the picture of Roman authority. In the, um, but in any case, all right. So um, I'm going to look at problems of measurement and standardization in the Roman Empire today by looking closely at practice, and especially economic practice. So that's really the, the perspective that I'm coming from in a larger project. Um, and I'm going to juxtapose two case studies. My aim isn't to be comprehensive. So the case studies do stand apart, although I'm going to draw some general conclusions. Um, but I'm going to highlight the strategies of individuals in specific contexts. As Andrew Rigsby has shown in a recent book, and as Serafina Cuomo was also discussing, measuring units and artifacts actually varied in the Roman world, despite the impression of standardization. And Romans showed a high tolerance for inaccuracies and errors in transactions, or at least for variations, if you want to put it that way, instead of errors. So how did Romans deal with this variability in practice, and how did it intersect with power? One of my case studies will center on Roman Egypt, and the other on the fort of Vindolanda in Roman Britain. These, uh, Vindolanda in Roman Britain will be the second one. So while these are very widely distant in location, my main interest isn't the differences between the sites, but the variability within each place. In Egypt, I'll discuss grain and focus on measurement as a whole physical process. So I'll also talk a little bit about the grain transport to Rome of the tax. A wide variety of grain measures existed in Roman Egypt, but the process of measuring and transport was sometimes standardized in limited ways. But these efforts remained partial. At Vindolanda, I'll focus on money, and I'll show how even when a fairly standardized physical unit was present, so coins, different people actually had different ways of writing and calculating monetary units. Well, almost everyone showed some desire to detach written units from coins, so to use units of accounts that didn't exactly reflect coins, but not everyone, even at one site like Vindolanda, did this in the same way. Um, from the economic perspective, case studies like this suggest to me not that Romans had any trouble getting things done, so there's a lot of broader debates in the Roman economy about the level of efficiency and sort of modernism and so on and so forth. Um, and I'm not interested in those as a primary question, but I think Romans still could have gotten a lot done regardless. <laughs> but I do think that the economy contained numerous information choke points, so places where control of tools and of the verification process was important and where strong incentives for individual elites to set the terms of a transaction, transaction existed. From a social history perspective, these cases suggest fragmentation in training and limited efforts to build shared networks of practice. So I'll begin in Roman Egypt, and here I'll focus not just on grain measures, but on grain measurement as a process. So I'm going to start with a few words about why I do this. Um, standardization is often conceptualized as the production of uniform units. We've heard already here a lot of other discussions of, of what standardization means and how it could happen, but um, particularly from the archaeological context, that's often how it's approached. Um, so by imposing exact units of money, weight, capacity, and time, modern states have created a standardized system that encompasses most transactions for, for citizens. But I'll argue using grain as an example, that measurement was only selectively standardized in the Roman Empire, and that we can best approach the selectivity by conceptualizing the act of measurement as a process, which the government controlled or co-opted at key moments. Where grain was concerned, the Roman imperial government didn't pursue standardization as a good in its own right, but only as linked to the practicalities of getting grain to Rome. 
and the standardization had limited impact on other kinds of transactions. And a broader implication of this approach is that some moves towards standardization in history might be driven by changes in moving and lifting and containing and transport rather than by a desire for um, identical units per se. For example, and here I'll take a very slight detour to Chicago actually, again, although in a different context. Um, one of the people who's shown most evocatively how units and process are interwoven in standardization is William Cronin, describing the impact of the city of Chicago and the railroad on the American West. Before the railroad, Cronin explains, grain was transported along complicated routes of roads, rivers, and canals in sacks. Sacks kept their integrity as objects as well as the identity of farmers whose grain they contained all the way to the markets in the city. The ability of a man to lift a sack was crucial when transport was complicated and the sack might need to be hauled in many different ways. And retaining the name of the farmer allowed the risk to stay with the farmer throughout the whole process. The railroad changed this because it introduced a new standardized container that carried the grain all the way to Chicago, the railroad car. The speed at which these carloads of grain poured into Chicago drove the adoption of the steam-powered grain elevator, which moved grain on a conveyor belt and measured it by weight rather than volume. Sacks were abandoned and grain became, quote, golden streams that flowed like water, end quote, classified according to standard grades and thus losing its connection to individual farmers. And ultimately this results in um, receipts that can be traded and a bank and futures market based on grain. So in Roman Egypt, there were obviously no railroad cars, but there was a government interested in moving large amounts of consistent quality to grain to Rome and then later to Constantinople. Because transport remained water and man or animal power based, the needs of this government constantly came up against the stubborn obstacle, the sack. At various points, the sack encountered other measuring units. So artibas, the measuring unit of capacity in Egypt, and the Roman modius and probably the Roman pound. And it also encountered units of value such as the coin. But the sack remained fundamental since donkeys and men had to move grain along roads and onto and off ships. Movement was thus one problem structuring the grain tax and the other was quality. Grain had to be assessed and assessing it was tiresome and labor intensive and I'll come back to that. Judging from papyri, a wide variety of capacity measures existed in Roman Egypt. The typical capacity measure for grain was the artaba but papyri refer to many different kinds of artabas, the cancalus, the receiving, the dispensing, and so on. The subdivision of the artaba was the coinix. In general, there seemed to have been 40 coinicas to an artaba, but some texts mention 48. It seems that there were different artabas as well as different coinicas in use, and that is the coinix was not a set and stable unit any more than the artaba was. We can see how people in private transactions dealt with this variation by looking at leases and loans in kind the main source of documents to do describe measures in detail. Roman law specified that a transaction had not taken place until the object of the transaction had been measured out. And this could give each transaction an intense specificity. You couldn't sell a pound of flour, you had to sell this specific measured out pound of flour. Even so, a lot of everyday accounts and records in Egypt and elsewhere in the Roman world didn't name the specific measures used in already completed transactions. This is probably because the measure was agreed on at the time of the transactions, but for purposes of later records, price was more important, the more essential piece of information to record. But leases and loans in kind were different because this, they specified payments that would take place at some future time. So the future measure to be used was often described, uh, perhaps because measures were not necessarily consistent from one transaction to the other. Quality was also a concern although this tends to be described formulaically. So grain is required to be new, pure, unadulterated, free from barley and sieved. Neither the government nor the market apparently demanded more complex grades of grain than this basic sort of clean standard. Measures in contrast to quality could be described in a wide variety of ways, which Rachel Mayer surveyed in a 2010 article. Measures differed from village to village and gnome to gnome, a governmental district to governmental district. Thus, for example, a six coinix measure of the village Hermeneus is mentioned a number of times in villages from the Arsinoit gnome, but nowhere else, while documents from the city of Oxyrhynchus tend to use four coinix measures. However, within the same village or city, different measures might also be specified, or the same measures described using different terms. A measure might be described as 10 coinix or quarter artaba, or with different people's names attached. 
The place may be the granary of a village, a large estate, or a temple, and the person the owner of an estate, or simply the person making the loan or lease. This specificity in naming measures serves a striking emphasis on the individuality of any given transaction. Um, and I won't read every word of this, but this is an exa a complete example where all these things come together. Um, this echoes the, the uh, particularity of the link between measurement and transaction in Roman law, but it also suggests how trust was founded in local knowledge. Um, both people in the transaction had to know, see, and touch the measure being used, hence the differing language used to describe the same measures. The terms of description were those that made the most sense to the parties to the transaction, not necessarily the terms in most general use. And finally, just to add to the variety, not all loans and leases in kind specified measures at all. In these cases, the measure might simply have been known or understood to both parties. So doubtless not every individual had his or her own, me her own measure, although some probably did. But most measures tended to belong to a set type of institution, public granaries, estates, or temples. Standards mostly seem to have depended on locally recognized authorities, even if there were a multiplicity of such authorities, and even if they differed from one place to another, from one village to another. Marketplace measures, according to mayors, were more rare, although they did occur. This is interesting to me. For people making leases, trust in local religious or hierarchical institutions was apparently higher than that placed in market measures. The lessor tended to have the power to specify the measure, and such a person was likely to use his or her own measure or that of the local authority he recognized or to which he or she had ties. Finally, loans in kind followed a slightly different pattern than leases, one in which the measure used to pay the loan off was almost always the same one used to make the loan itself. So this measure, again, usually belonged to the person making the loan, but the identical nature of the measures was stressed more. Given all this variety, how did the Roman government get the tax it needed and how did it determine measure and quality? The process of transporting grain for the tax has been described by various Roman historians, including UT Rickman and Meyerson. Grain was measured into sacks at the threshing floors of villages and carried to local public granaries, where it was stored until it was loaded onto donkeys, carried to a river, put onto boats sailing to Alexandria, and then finally on ships to Rome. The officials overseeing the granaries were called citologoi. Acting as a citologos was an obligatory service or liturgy, so something you had to do. The local elites of villages and towns thus had responsibility for this process. Throughout this journey, the grain seems to have mostly stayed in the same sacks, although it may have been remeasured at the granary or at the ships. When the grain did remain in sacks, its quality was apparently assured through the inspection of samples in sealed jars, and these could be weighed and examined for dirt or barley. This was meant to guard against the ship captain or others tampering with the cargo. The sacks as a whole, however, do not seem to have been weighed. Grain remains separated into distinct capacity units, and the sacks are described as containing either three or three and a third artibas. Sacks were probably all of a similar weight, 130 to 140 pounds, and this was a partly a practical matter, so it's about the weight a single man could lift onto a donkey. The grain may have escaped its sacks when it reached um, Italy, specifically Ostia. So uh, if a well-known tomb painting from Ostia, and we saw a, mo a mosaic that shows the same process in the last presentation. Um, so this depicts the grain ship Isis uh, Geminiana. And if it's accurate, as the grain was loaded onto riverboats for the journey from the port to Rome, it would be poured out of its sack into a modius or modi measure. Here, the size of, Egyptians, of the Egyptian sack shows another aspect of significance, for it was easily equated with italic modi. So one sack of three artibas equaled nine modi, and a sack of three and a third artibas would equal ten modi. Um, if this actually happened, once the um, uh, grain was poured into whatever kind of modius measure is shown in the relief, the sort of appealing part of it is that all grain, whether from Egypt or elsewhere, would become sort of one stream of Roman grain measured according to Roman measures. Um, the process does seem very labor intensive and slow, uh, so it might be a symbolic claim instead, um, but the symbolic claim would still claim all this grain was being measured according to Roman measures. Um, so grain for taxation was standardized, but standardized in a way that revolved around the practicalities of the transport itself, not in a way that involved othering re other measuring relationships around Egypt. 
This is visible in just how many and how separate many private transactions were from this three RTUB per SAC unit, which had no obvious significance in other kinds of payments in kind. So I'm going to go back to Egypt now. However, until the early fourth century CE at least, this system of transporting granaries did seem to allow opportunities for increased standardization, even if these were never imposed or universal. Some people used the process for their own private transactions. Managers of public granaries, the Sita Logoi, could make transfers between accounts at payments from one individual to another on both a local basis and across different granaries. So here the two realms, public and private, would seem to overlap a bit. Many orders of payment from granaries use artibas and fractions of artibas rather than the local coinix measures described above with little apparent attention to specific increments of phys physical measuring vessels. In other words, the units described in these documents are more abstracted from the process of physical measurement than the numbers in tax transport documents or in documents entirely separate from the granaries. So we approach a realm of fused public and private standardized value measures but with caveats. So granary payments weren't consistently standardized because even here we sometimes see extra levels of specificity in private as opposed to tax payments. And the shared system of transfers may not have meant that physically identical measures proliferated. So transfers between granaries or between people at the same granary especially didn't necessarily need to involve the physical transfer of the grain itself at all. Instead, they might be bookkeeping entries. The documented units and orders for payment could afford to be more abstracted from specific measuring instruments. But when an actual transfer did take place, as when grain was first deposited in the granary, a specific physical measure still sometimes needed to be specified. Sitologoi receipts for grain deposited into the granary, for example, often specify that the grain has been measured by the leveled public cankalus measure or the receiving measure. Despite such possible limitations, the shared system of granaries allowed both the processing of tax and many payments among individuals. To take Oxyrhynchus as an example, here the public granary seems to have had a strong presence in lease transactions in the second and third century CE specifically. Of leases that name specific measures, about half in the second century and a third in the third century specify that the measurement of the rent will take place at the public granary. And only two of these leases are on public land. And in the second century especially, a number of leases that do not require measurement at the public granary nevertheless add to the usual descriptors of quality, like new, pure, and unadulterated, the phrase as at the public granary or similar to the public granary. During this time period, the public granary thus acted as an optional st shared standard in several ways, a place of measurement, provider of measuring instrument, and an arbiter example of quality. Um, and this is, this is not complete, but it's one example of how this phrase at the public granary or, or as at the public granary can occur. Um, in other leases, as described above, the places and measures varied more widely and were more specific. Those leases take care to describe the multiple aspects of the performance of measurement. So place, the measure used, the person doing the measuring, and the quality. In contrast, the leases using the public granary often specified this fact that the public granary was being used and no more. So the public granary offered standardization not just of units but of a whole process. It's this process aspect I wish to emphasize and the fact that the process depended on infrastructure developed for a limited purpose, the grain tax payments. Public granaries created opportunities for standardization to the extent that people used them for private transactions. These opportunities arose from physical practicalities, the practicalities of storing one's grain at public granaries primarily for taxation and being able to use the infrastructure there, and the standardization that was available, again, uh, encompassed this entire performance. But use of granaries for these private transactions was always dependent on their larger taxation function nor did use of the public granary ever seem to dominate private transactions. So again, even when they're fairly widespread, you only have half of the existing leases from Oxyrhynchus in the second century and a third in the third. So a lot of people are still choosing more specific measures, even when this option existed. Oh, I'll stay there for a second. Uh, contemporary loans and leases between individuals sometimes use the measures of the public granary and sometimes not. The opportunities created by the granary system included, therefore, orders of payment, standardized transactions, use of more abstract units, and transfers across distances. But they depended on the purpose and shape of the larger infrastructure remaining the same. 
So I close this case study with a few points about how grain tax collection changed in late Roman and Byzantine Egypt and how this affected the opportunities for standardization that I just discussed. So from the second quarter of the fourth century on, the way grain tax was collected seems to have changed. Grain was brought straight from farms to ships and possibly measured there. A result of this change seems to be the decline or disappearance of the public granaries. Many villages probably still had some kind of granary, but likely smaller than before. And the granaries no longer appear in documents as processing grain or making payments, nor as places where private individuals would complete a transaction. Over time, taxation seems to have increasingly been channeled through landowners who advanced loans or paid salaries to agents who collected the actual grain. The consequences of this change are too complex to explore in detail here, but as far as ensuring standard measurement goes, landowners seem to have sidestepped the problem and shifted the risk, burden, and tedium of the measuring process onto these agents, who complain in letters about the difficulty of getting high quality and accurately measured grain from villagers. Landowners, meanwhile, seem to have exploited this uncertainty to increase profits and exchange grain for gold, which, unlike grain measures, was strictly standardized. At Oxyrhynchus, documentation of leases in general drops off in the fourth century and after. While many factors may have been at work, the concentration of land into larger estates seems to have been one. Jane Rowlandson has argued that independent tenants with diverse incomes gave way to those who had relationships with the same estate year after year, perhaps requiring fewer explicit leases. In the evidence that remains, the measures specified belong to the estate or simply to the lessor. Does this mean measurement as a whole was less standardized? If a few estates dominated the landscape, perhaps not. Everyone would use the same landowner's measures but publicly accessible measures or places to measure were no longer mentioned. In leases, at least, measurement was channeled through private hierarchy instead. Of course, in undocumented transactions, people may have used other measures, marketplace ones, for example. The point is that the overall picture probably involved all the variety of measures seen earlier, especially measures belonging to the owners of large estates, but without the additional option of the granaries. And though documentation is scarce in other regions as well, the picture looks similar. In several 6th century leases from Aphrodito, the lessee specifies that he would use the tax measure belonging to the lessor or simply the lessor's measure with no further specifications. So this is a long paragraph, but the part um, about the tax measure is in bold. <laughs> Papyri from Hermopolis referenced the Athenian measure, probably a measure derived from the name Athenaeus and thus perhaps associated with an estate, and also mentions various other measures. The absence of the granary seems to have meant that the measures of individuals were more ubiquitous. So to conclude this section, I've tried to show that standardization, especially where capacity measures are concerned, is as much about process and multiple successive acts as about identical units. Just as changes in 19th century Chicago were driven by the railroad and the grain elevator, a lot, some standardized measurement in Egypt was shaped by the infrastructure of granaries, by water transport, and by the necessity of carrying sacks. During certain periods, the demands of the government created increased opportunities for standardization among people making private transactions, but this required maintenance of an infrastructure that was ultimately aimed not at standardization in general, but at efficient transport for taxation. So when the transport and verification strategy changed, um, the scope for standardization shrank. So I'm now shifting to another case study <laughs> and to Roman Britain. So I now shift to Roman Britain and to difficulties of standardization or intricacies of standardization from a different perspective. That of how people at the same site wrote money in different ways, even when fairly consistent coins were present. I deliberately use the phrase wrote money rather than wrote about money because I'll be discussing accounts and not terminology and other kinds of sources. As a case study has two points. First, Romans wrote money in very varied ways. <laughs> so um, even at the same site in roughly the same time period and with a fairly uniform coin supply, Romans might use units of account that clashed both with other units of account and with coins. And second, this range of units resulted from various factors. I propose that these included differences in numeracy, different networks of knowledge and control, and perhaps a pervasive but low-level instability in physical units such as coins and weights. So coins are usually seen as very standardized, 
um, but there could be some variation, especially in bronze coins and lower level denominations. This might have contributed. By example is the Roman fort of Vindolanda, located near Hadrian's Wall and inhabited by Roman auxiliary soldiers. And I will give a brief overview of the site and the evidence. So four uh, main pe occupation periods are visible at Vindolanda. The early wooden forts built on top of one another in relatively quick succession between 85 and 130 CE. The stone forts, so there's two different phases of those, and civilian settlements of the third and fourth century, uh, or of the third, second and third century, excuse me, and the fourth century when all civilian settlement moved inside the stone fort. In this discussion, I'm going to limit myself to the wooden floor, forts since this is the only period from which documentation has survived. So those contexts are waterlogged, so wooden tablets have survived. Coins actually increased dramatically in later periods, but how people represented them in writing at Vindolanda isn't accessible. The wooden forts fall into five distinct periods of their own. These periods are all different phases of the same area, and so each period relates to only one building, in most cases the praetorium or commander's household. But period four was a barracks, and period five possibly a fabrica, or industrial workshop. This could, however, represent household production in the Praetorium, they're not sure. As you can see from this chart, which I compiled based on John Casey's coin report for early forts, coins occurred in low numbers and they were mostly um, higher value. So the denarius and the cistercius are the highest value denominations here. So there were a large number of high value coins, um, but coins of all denominations were present. Uh, the same types of coins occur in different buildings. There's not really any clustering of higher value coins in wealthier contexts, and there's no clustering suggesting that a context might have had more sort of ongoing exchange hand-to-hand -hand than another. In fact, given that the coins probably resulted from casual loss, the presence of more high value coins um, is surprising. Either people in the fort were too coin rich to care much about loss, or small change played a relatively minor role in the fort. Overall, this range of denominations and distributions shows that coins were present enough to act as a consistent value scale, but they may not have passed from hand to hand in actual exchanges all that often. In terms of sheer numbers, tablets are much more prominent th in these phases than coins. So over 700 tablets or fragments have been found, and more continue to be discovered, because excavations at Vindolanda are ongoing every year. 118 of the tablets published so far are either economic or military documents, and the rest are letters. The Praetorium or Commander's Household yielded by far the most documents, 45 of the 57 economic documents for which context is certain, and that's what's pictured in the chart up here. Ah, okay, I'll show you a picture. So they're very thin wooden um, tablets, so they're made of uh, a bark, I think, is the, so they're... You can fold them, some of them are, in, are kind of folded into concertina or codex form, uh, but they're relatively small and they have writing on them in ink. On them. So, uh, and most of the military non-economic documents come from the commander's household as well. So within the known buildings, the praetorium was clearly the dominant administrative context. And even if administrative documents existed elsewhere, in the Principia or Fort Headquarters, for example, the documents in the Praetorium show a lot of symbiosis between household and military affairs. These Praetorium documents reveal two aspects of control, regulating military labor, which I'll mention briefly but not spend a lot of time on, and mediating value relationships. Um, most military documents simply track where soldiers were, so this is an example of that kind of document, soldiers delegated to various tasks. Military accounts specifically track material things, and so the one on the left here is an account like that. Um, they still show a strong concern with labor and their structure, so this isn't the account pictured here, but one, for example, um, tracks, uh, tracks barley transports, and instead of structuring it by modi of barley, it's structured by acts of labor, so by the unloading of wagons. Um, but military accounts also sometimes, can we, okay. Um, also sometimes reference value relationships. Most of them don't track stores or distributions in the fort as a whole, but items that were specifically purchased, and they record how the materials from a tra specific transaction were used. So in this case, it's um, nails, boot nails that were purchased. 
um, non-military accounts that come from the Praetorium, so the ones that the editors have class classified as household accounts, show less concern with labor and are more directly concerned with money and more likely to have mathematical operations and fractions. So 192 on the right is classified as domestic and lists different items, their measurements, their cost, and ends with a total. So structurally, all these accounts are pretty simple, perhaps because they were notes and drafts, um, so preliminary. But even if they're simple in structure, they do show a concern with precision. They couple money and measures very frequently. So the attention to precision could just reflect the administrative context or perhaps the fort as an insecure exchange environment. Either of those things would make sense in this location. And finally, all accounts in the Praetorium use Roman money units, which is probably not a surprise. Um, monetary units are in denarii, but denarii coupled with fractions up to 1 16th, each expressed by a different symbol. The 1 16th is denoted by a kind of cursive A and probably represents an ass, so the lowest value bronze coin. The other fractions could all actually be made up in real coins, but this doesn't mean that they represented real coins necessarily. As a whole, the system of fractions differs from systems of fractions employed by Romans in Italy, and some symbols are unique to Vindolanda. So one example um, here on the, you have a, a denarius symbol, that's the sort of X thing, although the bottom half of it is missing, and then an S for half, sinis, and then the symbol next to it, which is a horizontal line with a vertical line underneath, probably a quarter um, denarius. So some of them are unique to Vindolanda. Um, they were probably compiled by slaves in the household, um, and these slaves would probably have had some kind of specific training, but not sure what that training would have been or if it would have taken place in the commander's household or elsewhere. Um, the Praetorium wasn't the only place where people wrote money, although there are only six tablets from the barracks. Uh, their differences from Praetorium tablets are striking, especially the next one I'm going to show, but this one has some differences too. Um, so monetary units are more varied and sometimes more concrete, which may suggest less numerical skill or greater reliance on physical coins. All the tablets seem to relate to civilian traders transacting with soldiers. Like the Praetorium household accounts, they concern money and goods, and they use measures when they name monetary amounts. But unlike the Praetorium accounts, they are organized around people, so people paying or owing sums and receiving or owing goods. The focus on names coupled with strikeouts um, or check marks suggests that many transactions depended on credit. And this fits well with the archaeological record of coins, which were few and mostly high value. But the presence of many names in every account, rather than say having each account, you know, each person have an account, might suggest that these credit cycles were short lived or just that organization was informal. Measuring units are mostly the same as in Praetorium accounts, but they're simpler there aren't any fractions smaller than one half. But monetary units differ um, a little bit, so not drastically. This one still uses denarii, but the notations it uses for subdivisions are different. Um, and it's unclear which fractions, of whether they represent asses and fractions of asses, or whether they all represent um, subdivisions of the denarius. Because they differ, it's hard to interpret them. Um, other documents in this room had a there's an example of two, two horizontal lines that might represent two asses or one-eighth um, of a denarius, or I think it's possible that it could represent a quarter denarius, actually, but I won't go into detail about that. Other documents in this particular room of the barracks had some connection to military supply. So this trader may have been uh, versed in practices similar to those in the Praetorium household in numerical technique, even if not exactly the same. This account is more different though. So this one was found in a different room of the barracks and it's kept entirely in asses um, and the symbol for the ass is different from the cursive A used for 1 16th of Praetorium accounts. Uh, so it's, um, it's a vertical line and then has this extra sort of mark to the left of it and it comes in front of the monetary amounts the way the denarius symbol does in other accounts. There's no totals and probably no fractions. The editors note a possible one on line 10. So this seems to have been a trader with his own system. As a group, all these tablets use Roman units of money and ones that are fairly closely tied to the actual coins, but they show multiple different ways of naming and manipulating the money, especially its subdivisions. In the case of the barracks, this is true even in the same building in the same archeological phase, although in different rooms. So traders seem to have had fairly individualized methods developed on their own or perhaps with their immediate network of colleagues. <coughs> 
I would add that at Vindolanda, some traders seem to have greater connection than others to the methods characteristic of more elite households, such as the Praetorium. The tablets are too fragmented to give many clues about what happened when or if written transactions were actualized with physical coins, but merchants may not have had much power in these moments. The tenuous nature of trust is reinforced by a letter from a trader apparently living in the period four barracks who complains of how he was beaten and his goods dumped out, but the reasons aren't given. As a whole, the, wrote was, wrote, the fort was unfailingly a Roman space of exchange using Roman units of measurement coins in monetary terms, but the specifics of these terms could still vary, and they suggest to me fragmented networks of practice. This is true, incidentally, also of other places. So um, places like Pompeii, which is more towards the center of the empire and where we do have a big coin supply, there's still differences in the way people write monetary amounts in wax tablets versus graffiti and things like that. So this variation could exist in a variety of places. Written money shows two pervasive characteristics, detachment from coins, although the level of detachment fluctuated, and variation in the actual units and fractions used. So as far as detachment from coins goes, I think this was related to two things, ease of numerical manipulation and variation in coins themselves. Developing a more limited system of units for money may have been numerically simpler, both for people conducting rapid everyday transactions and for those engaged in complex operations like accounting and calculating interest. In the latter context, I think this is pretty obvious. When we do have examples of calculating interest, fees, rent, the division of inheritance, and so on, Romans from Italy to Egypt usually used fractional systems that broke down monetary amounts in ways very different from physical coins. It is likely that these methods required training, and we see hints of it at Vindolanda, but the accounts are fragmentary drafts, so we don't see full development. The formal point that written units numerically simplified everyday transactions is more speculative on my part. It seems to go against the convenience of coin denominations, for one thing. But denominations might have been less convenient in lists, especially when a lot of calculation seems to have taken place mentally. And it's also likely that the use of credit was widespread among Romans of all social levels, and that not everyone always had access to physical cash. So if you didn't possess all the relevant denominations anyway, a simplified system for naming money would be logical, and this would certainly be relevant at Vindolanda. A second reason for written detachment from coins might be variation in the coins themselves. A rough stability did characterize much of the coinage of the Roman Empire up to the third century CE, and precious metal co coinage seems to have been more consistent than bronze. But we still have evidence for variations of a few millimeters or grams. In most cases, it's hard for us to assess how much this mattered to people, if at all. Um, written units could be used to arbitrate the value of coinage in exact ways, and we do see this in later periods in Roman Egypt, especially from the third century onwards. But even in times of greater stability, using alternative written units might have introduced a needed layer of negotiation. Most coins at Vindolanda would have been higher value and thus probably varied less by weight than, than the bronze coins, but this general tendency still could have contributed to what we see there. Um, so the second pervasive characteristic I noted was variation in written units. All documents um, at, Roman, at Vindolanda were working with Roman money, but they still use different subdivisions in their writing. It's hard to chart the reasons for this, but I'll make a couple general points. First and most obviously, there was no single way to write Roman money. So even if it was used partly to negotiate the value of coins, writing was not a unified stable counterpart to coins, which I feel like can often be the assumption when we're talking about units of account. It too was varied and textured, and it was used by different people for different purposes. Second, patterns in these practices might be conceptualized best as networks. So one obvious factor creating such networks involves differentials of power and training. People in elite or legal contexts, which often but not always overlapped, um, tended to use similar units. These units represented money as a number to be manipulated with specific calculation techniques. And although the evidence is usually indirect, the elite and legal context can also imply more control of the measuring process, whether this means verifying coinage or measuring goods such as grain. Networks in these contexts would be formed not just by shared practices or trust, but by power hierarchies, as well as political or social connection among elites and others. Outside this context, people seem to have used units that tracked coins more closely. They may have used simpler calculation methods and may have had less opportunity to verify coins or measures, but they had likely had shared networks of their own, 
some of these might have been quite small. So in a town, it might have been the trusted um, shop or, or merchant, as um, was discussed in the last talk. Or a town like Pompeii might have some norms that were shared by the whole town. At a fort like Vindolanda, however, it does not seem to have been the community of the fort itself that created norms, but more personalized and fragmented networks. Practices in the commander's household were probably shaped by power hierarchy and training, perhaps that characterizing Roman slavery. And practices among merchants may have been shaped partially by the degree of their connection to elite households or by the networks that they formed with one another. All this is, although this is harder to trace, um, a lot of people could doubtless navigate multiple networks like this. We shouldn't envision isolated worlds of exchange, but the multiplicity of the networks themselves is clear. So in both my case studies, considerable variation coexisted with various attempts to maintain more standardized networks. But these networks had a lot to do with power and with certain specific aims, and they remained localized and partial. All this fragmentation might seem at, ease with a at odds with a robust Roman economy, but again, although the size or health of the Roman economy isn't my primary focus, I don't see any reason why a strong economy couldn't coexist with the kinds of networks described here. But I would suggest an unequal economy with numerous information choke points, as I said at the beginning. So places where margins could be manipulated, where control of tools and verification process was important, and where strong incentives for elites to set the terms of a transaction existed. So I'm a bit pessimistic <laughs> in um, terms of how trust was created in different contexts. I think if we move a little away from the market, um, we see a lot of elite sort of intervention at key points. So replication and basic standardization of objects like coins was important, but they didn't govern the t system entirely and they were interrogated at key moments. Um, so on the, on the level of daily transactions, this lower level instability could probably just be negotiated through performance, but people making bigger transactions would probably wish to verify their coins and perform their own measurements and calculations, perhaps with their own tools. And their ability to do so might, although not necessarily, depend on their relative power. Thanks. question that emerged that I'm very interested in is who wrote the accounts? Because mm -hmm. you mentioned in passing that you think um, some of the accounts, the accounts from the Praetorium household would have been compiled by enslaved people. Why do you think that is the case? And also across the two case studies, I guess generalizing wildly, but uh, when one looks at a lot of material from Roman Egypt, there is some formulaic language, isn't there? Um, and I guess, I mean, I've always thought that's because the, most of these contracts, loans and so on, are, are written by scribes. Mm -hmm. And there's a possibly a more systematic way of training those scribes. Whereas Vindolanda, which counterintuitively is such a small place, where do we find all this diversity? Uh, it's back to the question of who was writing these things. So evidently, maybe they had been trained in different places, but I don't, I just wish to know more about this aspect. Yeah, yeah. This is a question I've been thinking about more lately and haven't looked into that much yet. But as, so as I started to find things that I would call networks, and then the idea of why do they form happens, and so training is important um, it to that, but I've only started to look at it. So the, the assumption that the accounts were written by slaves comes from the, the editors of the tablets, right? So, <laughs> but um, I do find that it's a very common assumption about accounts in Latin. So it's made in a lot of general works about um, Roman accounting, sort of in the Western Empire and in Latin specifically. It'll be made in the editing of documents. Um, and I don't know how reliable it is as an assumption, you know, because I think that this idea, there was a certain pervasiveness of slavery, but the idea of that pervasiveness, a lot of the evidence comes from Italy. So is it true in the commander's household as well? Um, and then even if it was slavery, how were they trained? is a question I haven't found much yet on either. So I found an article from like 19, 
70 or 79, I can't remember the author off the top of my head, but he talks about how he thinks that a lot of the schools, the sort of informal outdoor schools that we see referred to in literary sources were actually schools for primarily for enslaved people. Um, and he offers various reasons, and so that's a possibility that there were actually schools, but you know, it could have also taken place within a household. Or perhaps um, there's too much assumption of, of slavery in general. I, I think we should question everything. Yeah. So I'm glad you, you're questioning that. But, you know, we can talk more on that. Yeah, because in Egypt, it does seem more professionalized, right? Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Thank you all very much. Um, I would like to uh, go back to what I think I understood when you spoke about private transactions through public granaries. Mm -hmm. If I understood correctly what you said, I understood that um, the, um, we had evidence that um, The, the amounts were written down in artabas and fractions without, um, I don't know how you pronounce the other unit, Schoenix, Koenix, uh, mm -hmm. how do you pronounce it? Uh, Koenix. Koenix, okay. Is that what you said? Um, yes, in, in some types of yes. transfers. Yeah. So the, I'm curious, uh, you know, so far, I'm sorry this relates to my talk this afternoon, but so far, we have been using the word fraction um, as if all fractions were the same. Mm -hmm. However, for me, um, when we have fourths and halves, we do not have the same thing as when we have something like seventeenths. Mm -hmm. Because seventeenths, most likely, uh, were produced by computation, mm -hmm. whereas half and fourth uh, might have been produced by another operation. Mm -hmm. Or okay, so I was wondering which kind of fractions you have I in the um, accounts you showed us from Roman Britain. Mm -hmm. We saw uh, one half, one fourth, one eighth. Uh, so it's very specific type of fraction. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, because I mean, what is at stake is not so much fractions, but what mm -hmm. is at stake is whether these values were produced certainly by computation mm -hmm. or perhaps by measurement mm -hmm. or by which computation. So this is what is at stake in the kind of um, fractions you have. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I was curious which, especially for this case where you were surprised not to have smaller measurement units, but artabas and fractions, I was, I was interested in uh, figuring out which kind of fractions you have mm -hmm. as a hint to what produced these values. Yeah, yeah. In the, um, I would have, so to be absolutely sure, I'd have to go back and check the, the documents from the granaries. But off the top of my head, I think that they are all, um, they are all fractions that could be like real physical fractions. So they're not, they're not, they don't look like fractions that were produced by computation, even in the ones that might have been just bookkeeping or transfers. Um, and that's in the public granaries. In accounts in general, I think, um, and so far this is an impression rather than something I verified systematically, but I do think there's an interesting trend over time um, in all accounts, whereas in earlier ones, so um, second, third century, there are more fractions that could have corresponded to physical acts or phys physical measuring vessels. And um, in later ones, especially the ones from these big estates, there are a lot of fractions of both gold and grain that are clearly produced by computation. Like they get very, very small and minuscule and they would have been hard to work with. And yeah, so I think, um, I think there's some changes over time. But from the earlier period, 
even if they're noted in the granary in a way that seems a little more abstract because they don't mention the koinikas, they're still not really, not necessarily fractions produced by computation. But in any event, this is something I launched in the discussion mm -hmm. um, that looking at which fraction we have, because <coughs> yesterday we saw lots of fractions in the documents, but they were very specific types of fraction and very often with large uh, powers of two that combine in a certain way in operation and so on. So the, the worlds of quantities that is shaped through the measurement unit is really something on which we can focus mm -hmm. to understand more precisely what produce these quantities that we find in our records. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to, um, I've been playing with the idea that in ancient China, in relation to the research I already mentioned, granaries were banks. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that there is something of that kind that is coming out of the picture you are drawing. So I was wondering whether you had a comment on um, this way of reading granaries? Um, not an extended one. <laughs> Just that the, the, the thought has crossed my mind, too. Um, I, st I, noticed, I noticed them most sort of functioning as an institution when I had this idea of standardization in mind. So I haven't sort of approached them explicitly with banks in mind. But I will say a lot of, um, so when a lot of discussions of banking in the Roman world, when they include Egypt, it's interesting to me that the banking documents they're talking about are usually related to granaries, um, which is interesting to me when we're talking about, you know, what kind of accounts did bankers keep and how complex did they get it. To me, it makes a difference if they're related to these granaries or if they're, you know, a banker's accounts and money in his house or something. Um, so there's definitely, they definitely seem to be able to act as banks and to be sort of described that way in publications. Um, I just haven't personally yet sort of analyzed them with that idea in mind, but it's there for sure. Uh, just out of ignorance, since we have uh, kind of deconstructed uh, the whole uh, uh, issue of standardization. And now that money comes in, is, is money really properly standard? Or if we look carefully, uh, it's, it's also um, less uh, stable than we might imagine? I think it's less stable than we might imagine, <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is interesting. Um, it was a little frustrating to me originally because I, well, I came into my um, bigger project with the idea that money was that the repli the vast replication of Roman coins was really interesting and that this was going to be the stable counterpart to everything else and in some ways it kind of is but in other ways it also shows a lot of gray areas um, for example it's it's interesting to me that even though you had this stable system of denominations nobody uses it in writing in quite a straightforward way um, it's interesting that when you look at the weights of the coins, again, the bronze coins in particular can vary a fair amount, and we don't always know whether that mattered to people, but it's, <coughs> oops, it's there, whereas like the silver coins are much less like that. Um, but one trend I do notice is that in more informal accounts, people will often not name measures. They'll just, so they'll say like, I bought grain at the market and I paid, I, I bought like a denarius worth of grain at the market or something although it wouldn't be a denarius because that's Egypt. But anyway, that idea. Um, so you'll have the price listed, but not the measurement. So, and there are a lot of cases like that where I'm kind of like, well, price seems to be more important, at least for people to remember and document than measurements are. So maybe money does have a special place. Um, so my working theory at the moment is that coins did act as a really standard object for a lot of people, but that it wasn't, it wasn't completely hands-off, like it still got interrogated sometimes, like people still wanted to weigh it or analyze it at certain times. <laughs> 
even in the early empire when it's usually assumed it was pretty trustworthy. I just had a little thing about uh, the place for credit uh, because credit also means the promise of something that will happen. So the payment of money, for instance, mm -hmm. and uh, like like the fractions case or like the promise of money and the necessity of writing it down and the circulation of abstract money. Mm -hmm. uh, so is there any way to understand that in together with the context of transactions, abstract money, in circulation and the necessity of writing and between the household and the military then how do we uh, say what kind of documentation emerges in specific respect to money and then the possibility of you know educating the slaves or whoever is writing mm -hmm. so, so is it is a question about how the abstract and the concrete were were mediated yeah kind of? yeah um I, yeah, <laughs> well, it's interesting to me that we find different levels of abstraction in the writing. Um, so in, in wax tablets from Roman Italy, people use sesterci and fractions as a unit of account. In graffiti in Pompeii, they use asses, uh, the bronze coin, and then they, they have a half, asses and half, and never lower than a half. In the Vindolanda documents, it's um, the silver and bronze coins. So I think, um, and then in Egypt, sometimes it can be gold or in later context, sort of very abstracted units. And then earlier, they have their own, their own coinage and their own drachma account units. Um, what I see in earlier time periods especially is that either the abstraction will be a way, um, it's not necessarily a way to verify the coins, but it's a way to, to calculate more easily or to assess fees of various kinds. So in Egypt early on especially, you have units of account that seem mostly used to calculate like surcharges and fees, but they're not, um, they're not in any obvious way used as ways to mediate the value of the coins. So it's not like there's a unit of account that's equivalent to a certain metal content. Instead, they seem to be used for a variety of other purposes. Um, and it's only when the Roman coinage gets really unstable for a while in like the third and fourth centuries that you start to see units of account that are very clearly indicating the metal content, like the silver content of a coin. Um, so I think the abstraction serves different purposes, um, but it's not always to ensure that the value of the coinage itself stays the same. So I do think there are periods of time when there's a lot more trust in the coins as objects and then periods of time where they're um, they're trying to use the written units to mediate that that value. Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> so thank you, Melissa. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you again. And <laughs>